Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. I'm Danny Smith, Executive Vice President and Co-Owner of Color ID. Welcome to Color ID's Campus Forum Series, Continuing the Conversation. Today's session is titled Remote Carding is, and is the second in a series of five live events that will run each Tuesday and Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Each session generally lasts about 60 minutes and will repeat once again on the third forum series at future dates to provide attendee flexibility. Please feel free to invite colleagues from your institution or your company or anyone you know across the identity industry who would benefit from participating in the Campus Forum series. Our registration link is located at our website at colorid.com. At the beginning of today's session, relevant to the institutional attendees, there will be a Minty poll to learn more about the common challenges that you're now experiencing. It's simple to do. You just open a browser on a PC or mobile, go to menti.com, that's M-E-N-T-I.com, and then you type in a six-digit code. We'll give you the code and explain more during the presentation. You know, it's really nice to develop such meaningful relationships over the past 20 years, and we're really incredibly grateful that we can come together and stay connected. Once again, we have a large group of identity industry attendees joining us today from all over the world. And as we say, whoever you are and wherever you may be, we welcome you. And we hope that you find the investment of your time a great value and encourage you to be interactive in these sessions. Now, leading today's technical discussion will be David Stallsmith, the Director of Product Manager, uh, Product Management for Color ID. And David brings a wealth of technical information for over 14 years of working with advanced identity solutions. Many of you know and have worked with David over the years as he works closely with manufacturers, vendors, and end users to promote the understanding of the complicated products and services that comprise our identification industry. He's contributed to the decision-making process at many universities, healthcare facilities, and government agencies as they consider acquiring contactless, smart card, mobile ID, and biometric systems. And since 2006, David has presented annually at the NACU conference, and he's also presented at NACUS's annual and leadership conferences, the European and the Canadian Campus Card Users Conferences, and Full Day Identity Summits hosted by prominent universities throughout North America. Joining David on today's session as moderator is Mark Deegan, Color ID's Corporate Marketing Manager. And in addition to managing Color ID's marketing department for the past 16 years, Mark also juggles the duties of account representative for some of our most strategic partners, both customer and corporate. And he's also the project manager for Color ID's banking-related customers. Mark and David's technical knowledge concerning advanced identity solutions is a testament to their commitment to our industry and a great example of the value differential Color ID employees brings to our customers and our corporate partner relationships. Now, just a few housekeeping items will get started. We really want to encourage these sessions to be interactive as possible, so please utilize the question box to submit questions. And depending on your question, we may answer in real time or wait till the conclusion of the presentation during the Q&A. In addition to asking questions, we'll also have live polls throughout the presentation. So please participate in those, and, and if you could, be as prompt as possible. Also note that Color ID's higher education team is listening in on today's session, and they wanted to, you to know that they're here for any questions or any follow-up discussions that you may have. Just call or shoot your account manager an email. Also, a reminder that everyone who completes this five-session form will receive a certificate of completion and also a Color ID swag bag filled with some really cool stuff. Color ID can confirm everyone's attendance, so you don't have to do anything in regards to that. However, each session does require separate registration, so please make sure you register for all the future sessions. Thanks again, everyone, for the privilege of your time and keeping us connected while we're apart. Now I'm gonna turn it over to David and Mark to get started. David, take it away. Great, Danny, thank you very much for that introduction. and. As I was looking at our screen while you were talking, continuing the conversation, Color ID has lots of conversations with lots of schools, campuses, and and people who use and issue cards in lots of different industries and markets. And continuing the conversation, we aren't doing a lot of the things we normally do, but we will keep talking about it. And this is a conversation we have never had. What do we do? when we're not able to make cards and the people we would make cards for are not there. So taking us on to our agenda, where are we? We'll talk about that. What do we need to do? 
how do we do that? And then when, if when this happens again, and why we're not even gonna to touch. So that's kind of the who, what, where, when, why of our agenda. Mark, you wanna lead everybody through the Menti poll? Let's do that first. Let's do that first, Dave, good idea. Um, so if everyone could use their phone or laptop computer, go to www.menti.com. It's gonna prompt you to plug in a six digit number. So this one is going to be 106486. After plugging that in, just going to want you guys to read the question and just answer it. Uh, plug in whatever you feel um, best connects to your card office. What would help your card office as this whole thing continues to unfold? And as people start entering their answers, um, we'll start seeing uh, the responses pop up on the screen and any responses that occur uh, bigger and bolder, the, that's times where people have said the same thing more than once. So if we could try to, to do that, we got the first one coming in. Card office needs direction, I hear you there. Um, photo upload adoption, mobile credentials, those are definitely good ones. Photo upload has been incredibly um, uh, popular here in the past six months. Let's see here. Um, yep, photo upload adoption. Yep, mobile credentials again, just not plural. Um, very good. Uh, automation. Yes, we all want it to be seamless and work very easily. Revenue. Staff, there you go. A lot of you probably don't have um, some some of the card offices we've been working with. Some of the card offices are completely shut down. Some of them are open because they have a lot of uh, COVID-19 uh, folks on campus recovering at dormitories and everything. So be interesting to see what is unique at your campus. Leadership, okay, students on campus, yes. I would love nothing more than to have students on campus because that would be normal and I would love to have normalcy back. Um, here. How to verify identity. Yeah, definitely. Um, issue mobily. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, cool. So let's, now that we have some good responses here, what we'll do is kind of, um, uh, stop there and we'll kick off the uh, presentation and David will start going there. I'll jump back in from time to time uh, launching the polls and doing some more Q&As with you guys. So thanks a lot. Dave, it's all you. All right. Thanks, Mark. And very interesting. Thanks for taking the time to type those things in. There's our agenda. Remote control or not so much control. Uh, there was a time not too many years ago when you, you said anything like remote card office you would have probably been thinking more about piles of wires and something with four wheels on it. We never imagined that they would send us home or that the card office would be empty or that the students would not be at the card office. So that leaves it, that brings us right to our next poll. Mark? Yeah, Dave. So our first question is going to be, is anybody in your card office? Kind of um, asked this earlier when we were doing the Menti. So if everyone could just jump on, do some voting real quick, we'll keep this uh, presentation going on smoothly. So a lot of you are voting right now. Thank you very much. We can get a few more responses. We'll close it down and we'll review those and, and talk about them. Okay. Perfect. All right, I'm going to close it down. I'm going to share it now. So 50% uh, of you go in occasionally. 29% uh, go in for essential projects only. 21% are not allowed to go on campus, period. And then zero, business as usual. So that's to be expected, the business as usual. This is definitely not business as usual. Um, the 50%. Of some of you going in occasionally, that sounds pretty consistent with what we're seeing um, across all of our 
university customers as well as some of the other vertical markets that we work in. So very cool. All right, Dave. Great. Um, yes, interesting that that's pretty much the color ID story. We have a few people in the office every day. We have things to ship, orders to get out, things that just need to be done at the office, but no more people there than need to be there. Everybody else is also working remotely. So we're all feeling your pain. <laughs> Networks, uh, conversations dropping, and uh, all kinds of other stuff. So we, meanwhile, on campus, what's not happening now? Pretty much everything in the one card system that or that touches the one card system is not happening now because nobody's there. They're not going through doors. They're not in the library. They're not printing and copying. Of course, they're not in the dining halls. Um, for sure, there are no exams and nobody's taking attendance. So the one card system is shut down. However, in the background, you can be sure that the data is still running. It's moving around between all the various systems. If anybody is enrolling in in, the, in school, if they're you know um, getting ready for whenever the next term is, all the all you know data is moving. Computers are running every day, um, so that's all still going on. You're just not there. Um, so when you are not connected to your office or not at your office, how do you connect? Thanks, Dave. So we've got a couple of options here for everyone to interact with. Just select one, whichever best fits your card office. And again, once we get the responses in, we'll go over them real quick. Awesome, okay. We're gonna close it and share it. So let's see here, 69% of you uh, VPN to the card office PCs, 23% are doing a browser-based connection to campus system, and then eight are just simply managing email only. All right, Dave. All right, and and again, that pretty much reflects Color ID story. We we mostly VPN VPN into machines at our office uh, because there are resources in the office on servers uh, that are in many of them are secure that we need to access and the VPN is the only way to do that. Um, interesting that almost a quarter of you do have browser-based connections so that's important and useful uh, to know. So how many weeks? We asked this question first three weeks ago when we first presented this webinar and at that point there wasn't much thought that anybody would be coming back this summer, but I think at this point, we all know that's not gonna happen. Um, I think we have a poll about that, which would be interesting to see, but obviously this is not a normal year. So talking about what the card office does, and we've talked about this in our identity management presentations also, you still, whether the students are in front of you or at a distance, you need to establish identity. Who are you and how do we know that? And colleges, universities do a pretty solid job of, of establishing identity. It's because there are so many different channels. Somebody applies for a job, somebody applies to be a student at the school. Uh, there will be mailings, uh, brochures, catalogs, there, uh, snail mail, there'll be email. So that establishes a, di a, a digital identity, uh, almost certainly, if it's a student, there'll be financial aid involved. And so other agencies, government agencies, financial institutions will be involved sharing information relative to that one identity. So one person it keeps being identified through more and more different channels. And there may be other services involved also coming in, uh, validating that identity through third party. Um, so that's all really good stuff. By the time that somebody shows up on campus, you have a pretty good idea that they are who they say they are. But, and so the data is still flowing into the card office. Your PCs, unless they've been turned off, are probably still receiving information. Your server that hosts your ID production database is still probably receiving updates, but it stops there. 
obviously. You're not printing cards. And the other piece of the puzzle that a card office offers is the really important face-to-face -face final verification because human beings are pretty good at assessing whether somebody is who they should be and or say they are and you know right now you're not having that so um everything is just virtual they're virtual applications people are assigned usernames and passwords based on all the processes we just described but we don't have that face to face to gov to you know to to check the government id to to look at the photo to look in their face we aren't able to do that so going back to the word cloud automation verification uh, these are in a digital world a virtual world these take on different meanings because they'll involve different processes well a lot of the go again going back to the word cloud a lot of the answers had to do with you know what would help your card office right now a lot of it had to do with mobile automation, uh, virtual things. However, we're still not past the fact that pretty much every college campus in the in North America issues cards, and that's not going to go away. And, and when students show up, as much as you might wish you had a mobile solution in place and you could just enroll them over the air, it's not there yet. And so you will need to issue cards. So let's talk about um, how we will do that. And first of all, let's go back to that question I posed a few minutes ago. Perfect. So that question is, when do you think students are going to return? Do you think they're going to be there for orientation, maybe the fall semester, or I have no idea. Let's see what we got. Awesome. Thanks, everyone, for being real quick on this one. Very helpful. And I'm going to share. So 71% maybe for fall semester, 24% have no idea, and then 6 and time for orientation. Let's keep our fingers and toes crossed that it's for orientation. That would be awesome. All right. Thanks. Yeah, some holdouts for uh, best case scenario. I love that. Uh, but I think pretty much everybody is planning on a fall arrival, which puts puts us back about 10 years or 15 years ago. Students would show up. You know, no orientation. Everybody just showed up on move-in weekend, freshmen, and you just had to make cards as fast as you can. You maybe you would have been able to batch a bunch of cards in advance and and hand them out by residence hall, but either way, there's a crush of cards to distribute because the cards represent access, they represent payments, and they need to be handed out quickly as soon as somebody arrives on campus. So. This here is a, a skeletal description of what goes on in, in making and handing out a card. And I highlighted a couple things that take some more time than others and that could possibly be improved to streamline the process. And one is capturing photos. Capturing photos takes quite a bit of time. Uh, stand, stand a little closer, back up a little bit, push that hair out of your face, smile, don't smile, hat, nope, sunglasses all that stuff and then you capture the photo and then like i said you 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 will check government issued ids visual inspection is often best because these ids are made to be assessed visually there are scanners that can can check the watermarks and the infrared printing and all kinds of you know uv whatever um you know high security technologies are in those cards but but most, I think most schools just do a visual inspection. So is there a way to streamline these? And, and regarding the photo, uh, everybody's pretty familiar, I think, with the self-service photos where you're, the students, the new employees, everybody is invited to upload a photo and, and not have to take up time in the card office capturing that photo and then getting it into your ID software. Um, when we talk about photo upload, the first thing everybody asks is, well, is it integrated? And you know, the, you know that's because you've learned. You've learned if you have a one card system, if it's not something coming from that one card system, it better be integrated because otherwise it's going to be painful. So, you know, the answer to the question for the couple products we'll discuss here in a moment is yes, they are 
pretty integrated and, and uh, I'll describe a little bit more about that. Also limits of the applications. These are generally pretty simple designed to do one thing, capture photos and upload it. So sometimes we've watched schools retain these services and think, oh, well, maybe it'll be a communication uh, channel. And, and it can be a little bit, or maybe we'll be able to get them to do this, or maybe we'll be able to get them to do that. And I can only just say that whenever you're buying a commercial software product or service, it's best to take it at face value, understand what is being offered and plan on that. Anything that could be custom, Beyond that is a bonus, and but but it could add time and expense, and and sometimes doesn't even work. So um, just keep that in mind as you as you look at these various services. Understand what they offer, and go with that. So uh, to the two pro well many different products here, um, Fargo Connect and True Credential both support mobile photo capture, but they're not self service. Uh, many universities have built their own photo upload um, submission process so you know the students can log on to the school site and they you know it's great some schools love them and they work well and others they're older and maybe they're not working so well and they're looking to replace them seaboard offers a photo upload service as part of their offering and then the two kind of independent uh, companies that offer these products cloud card which is fully cloud-based and is also the white label service that transact schools use when they use online photo submission. And then my photo, which is available both as an on-prem uh, product or as a cloud hosted service. So Cloud Card made a nice little diagram and because they did that and it was easy, I just <laughs> dragged it into my PowerPoint. So we'll just use this for those of you who may not be familiar with the process uh, to quickly go through it. Um, either the student or employee or whomever will go to a school website and click on a link and use single sign-on, which is all set up in the background, and that will generate an email to uh, invite the user to upload a photo, or you can upload a card cardholder email addresses and ID numbers into the service. Either way, it generates an email to each of those email addresses, inviting them to upload a photo. Um, it's secured uh, with um, an, an SSL certificate, and so it's a it's a you know it's a secure link. The, the uh, photos and the data is encrypted both in transit and at rest. So it, even though it's going to a mobile phone and, and all that, it, it's all done in a browser. It's not done in an app, so nobody has to download an app. The students take upload a photo or they take a selfie, and then the card office administration people examine the pictures, they approve them, they, they deny them, they can make comments. And then after approving the photos, they are downloaded to a folder or database that was previously designated. This is how the admin screen looks for, for a lot of these. It, they're, they're pretty simple. The tabs are on the left and on the right is the window where you're actually gonna do your, your judging. And uh, in this particular application, a green bar is the software's suggestion that this is a good photo. You could probably approve it and the red bar would mean that, especially with a black background and for some other reasons, you might want to deny that photo. So these are, uh, this is how CloudCard approaches it. My photo is similar, has has um, other features and, and um, you know, everything is a little different. So if you're looking at those, we'll be happy to talk to you about one or the other, but uh, that's how that looks. So having, if you are able, and this could be done pretty quickly, um, if you're looking at a uh, you know, not complex integrated solution. You just want to start capturing photos as quickly as possible. It would be possible to have one of these services up and running within a matter of weeks. And we have a number of schools right now. Both these companies are just running flat out to keep up with the demand because schools want to get the photos in now if they can. And this is a software that can facilitate that. So um, it, you know, there's a queue but it's not infinite. So if you're interested in those, 
you know, we can help you select the right one and, and then go forward with uh, getting that in, installed in a way that works for you. So photos are, assuming that you're able to streamline that photo process, the other thing in the card office workflow that takes a lot of time and requires physical presence is printing. And you can encode a magstripe, you can capture pre-program -pro chip data. These are things that can save time during the print process. So the printing itself takes the time that it takes. The printhead has to go back and forth across the card for four panels. The card has to take time to flip over and come back to it again. And then if you're applying lamination, all of that takes time and you can't really speed it up. But if you are spending time tapping cards and, and manual entering data, that is something that can that can be improved through automation. Also, cards and printers have to be somewhere, so they need people. And even if you are able to send a print job to a printer at a remote location, uh, if you are trying to print a bunch of cards, you know that at some point somebody has to load cards in the hopper, somebody has to empty the full hoppers, and even more importantly, somebody has to clear the jams. So either as it looks like many of you have the option to go into the office occasionally you can go in print some cards take them out of the hopper ship them do whatever needs to be done um, another option is is bring a printer home and in this regard if you have a large laminating printer in your card office that's going to be awkward to get out of the card office unplug drag it out to wherever your car is parked and bring it home if you're thinking of this as something you might have to do a decent amount of, perhaps you'd want to get a, a smaller, lighter printer. There are some very nice models that are much easier to carry that don't have lamination, but they will get printing done. So uh, it's important to, uh, you know, just think about how can you get the printer that you need and get somebody near that. Um, obviously, you can VPN, VPN into the printer PCs, and if you have browser-based support, then perhaps you're getting some feedback on the printing that's being done remotely. Um, one thing to keep in mind is if you're thinking that browser-based software is your answer to printing remotely, I mean, aside from the physical requirements of being at the printer to clear the jams and stuff. There's some other things to keep in mind too. ID printers don't have a lot of smarts built into them. I mean, they're wonderful little devices, but they're not like multifunction devices. MFDs have a PC in them. That powerful network endpoint, you know, because you walk up to the screen, you can send emails, you can, you know, I mean, you can do all kinds of things. It's a little computer. Uh, printers do not have built in that kind of computing power. So when you're working from a browser and a, and a browser-based software product, they usually work best if you have local hardware support. And, and a good example of that is if you logged into this GoToWebinar, um, you were probably asked to download a GoToWebinar client to your computer. And the reason is because you need something local to run your computer and your your microphone and your speaker. And, and so that is what the local software bit is doing. And, and it gets updated all the time because uh, go to web, all these different services know that there's, you know, there are Windows updates, there are updates to all kinds of other things going on at various PCs. And they want this stuff to constantly work regardless of updates. So it, it's there's always something on the local machine. Um, True Credential communicates directly to the printer through the Cat5 cable over the, over the network. Uh, so it does not have the benefit of having that hardware endpoint to support the printer. And, and sometimes it works great, but we've also heard sometimes there are challenges there. Um, HID Fargo Connect introduced a device called a console and I'll show you what that looks like because it does, in a way, solve that network endpoint problem. Another way to approach printing is um, as an outsource. So if you're not able to get to your printers and print the cards you need, um, then maybe you could contract with a third party to print your cards. Who is near their printers, uh, like 
a company like Color ID who may have printers at home with some of our engineers, <laughs> for example. It's, it's not really that complicated a process. You collect your card data, you submit it to a service bureau, then distributing the cards can either be done when the students arrive or there are fulfillment services where cards can be sent to each card holder by the service provider. We're all familiar with that because credit cards and, and debit cards are sent out this way every day. So there are processes to do that and that's an option. It's cost a little bit, but it is a way to get cards out. Um, if you find yourself in a terrific time crunch and you are having to resort to drastic measures because you have 500 people coming next Monday and there's no way you can get your cards made in time the way you normally make them, perhaps you would do something like this. I mean, I'm just trying to think of alternatives here, but if you have to get cards in somebody's hands, a way to do it quickly is make your process a lot simpler. Maybe just print black, just K panel. Um, you can print a, a one pass K panel in, in 10 seconds and encode the magstripe, read the chip, anything else that normally goes on in your printer that you know can can happen pretty quickly and save up to two and a half minutes per card if you had to do that. Not saying anybody wants to. I asked Joe Wright, head of our engineering group, about this. He goes, nobody wants to do that. I said, yeah, I know, Joe, but I need something to talk about in a webinar. <laughs> Remote card office. So, all right. Next poll, Mark. Thanks, Dave. So here we go. Um, next poll question. Do you have some automated processes for production now? So as always, please uh, choose which one best fits your card office and I'll close it down. We'll review the answers. Also, if you guys have any questions during the presentation, you can feel free to submit them. Uh, to me under the questions portion of the GoTo meeting, uh, and I will hold those till the end of the presentation and enter them then. Okay, looks like we're good. All right, so here's what we got, guys. 73%, we have a photo upload system that helps. That is awesome. Okay, and then tied for 13%, we have we can print remotely even if no one was there, as well as no, we are only set up to work in the office. So that 73%, that's that's a pretty high percentage, don't you think, Dave? Yes, no question, Mark. That um, that's certainly the highest number we've seen for that on a poll. So. Good for all you folks. You've already fixed that part of the process, and and you're able to at least move quickly through that. And 13% uh, of you are printing remotely, so you know that's that's working well. Um, but uh, yeah, it's you know we're all grappling with ways to to make this work. So if you know you get through the fall and you've handed out your cards. But during this time, you're thinking about what are we going to do in the medium term? What, you know, what if this happens again? Because, you know, they're talking about a second wave and all this stuff. And then, you know, we know flus come through every year. Uh, what, what things like these crises demonstrate, obviously, is they show where we have weaknesses, where are vulnerabilities, where are things uh that are not robust and that are inflexible because they can't they aren't working very well for us when our systems are stressed and so you know you the financial industry is going through that all you know lots of different segments of our culture society uh international stat you know everything going on there are lots and lots of stresses that are being revealed and or that are revealing weaknesses in the underlying structure. So in the card office, you know, for example, we've been putting off mobile for a long time. It's been available for 10 years or so in some form or other, but it was always expensive. It was always hard to get to. Could something like mobile be something that perhaps uh, we need to move to a little more quickly because it could perhaps be a way of 
achieving more robustness and more flexibility to accommodate these kinds of shocks in the future. So mobile credentials uh, can be issued over the air and that does solve a lot of the problems of having to print cards remotely and hand them out somewhere. So we will discuss mobile in another forum and uh, stay tuned for that. Beyond the VPN, I talked a little bit about this already, the ID software and solutions, the connectedness is built in uh, because of the network capabilities. Again, these are not, these are more like medium term solutions because often it takes institutions, you know, one or two years to figure out which product is going to work, how are you going to pay for it, and then you have to get it set up and running. And so um, one of these solutions that is is really gaining a lot of traction uh, right now and, and has a number of impl implementations being put in right now that I, I mentioned earlier is Fargo Connect. Fargo Connect is a, is a cloud-based service. It includes a card designer and a way of monitoring all your printers that are connected. But really the, the cool thing about Fargo Connect is this console and it's a piece of hardware. It, it solves that hardware problem I talked about a minute ago, where you need something to plug your network cable into that has some intelligence and can communicate with a bunch of printers. So you plug in the console and it manages all your printer, your drivers, um, the, the printers can connect over USB or Ethernet from the console, and it has a nice print release feature, which you're all familiar with from your MFDs, and it also keeps track of your printer status, consumables, settings, updates. So it, it gives you a lot of really important features for managing your printers, and it provides that invaluable network endpoint. Also, um, the the cloud service that sits behind Fargo Connect has a dashboard and you can do some reports from there, who was logged in, what, what's going on with your printers, um, what is being printed. So if you're, if you're printing on network, if you're printing far away, this can help support all of that. Now, before I leave it, one very important feature of Fargo Connect is that it absolutely requires integration with some other system. It does not have a front end. It is designed to be the print support for any other system in front, which would be your one card system that is integrated Fargo Connect, which would be Seaboard. Atrium is working on it. Um, Secure access control system is, is supports Fargo Connect. So a number of a number of campus solutions have integrated Fargo Connect. And so it sits in the background. When you're using it every day, you're not seeing Fargo Connect. You're getting all the benefit of the printer support from that solution, but you're actually printing your cards through your one card system or through your access control system. So you, you have that direct database connection and then Fargo Connect manages it in the background. Uh, and trust data cards, true credential. Everybody should be pretty familiar with this. It's the successor to IDWorks. Um, it was a radical redo. It's it's not related to IDWorks in any way. It is a server-based software, and so it can sit on a web server. Most of the time, sits on a web server on your premises, but it can also be in the cloud. It is optimized for data card printers, although it will support other printers. Um, it does have an API, so if somebody wants to integrate to this, as the one card solution providers have. So um, Transact, Seaboard, both offer full integrations of True Credential. Again, when you go to, I know in, in Seaboard, when you're printing, you'll see your Seaboard interface through a web browser, you won't see True Credential, but it sits in the background and, and provides all the benefits of the True Credential suite. Um, it behaves, like I said, it behaves very differently than ID Works, but it is an option out there. Um, Weblink ID is from a company called Valid, which is a very large card manufacturer uh, with headquarters in Brazil. They came up with a, a web-based software. It could be 
um, hosted or it's often just run on-prem. Atrium has, has offered this at times and it has an API. Um, Card Exchange Producer is a software. It is a desktop software, but it does have a nice network type of feature where it can support a, a certain number of licenses for concurrent use. But even better, it has a print server. So if you are trying to print to a server somewhere else, it could be across the hall or it could be across the country, you could, you could from your desktop instance of Card Exchange, you could send a print job to the print server in that remote location, which is a PC. So again, it's a it's an intelligent network endpoint device. It's a PC. It doesn't have to have card exchange running on it. It just needs card exchange print server. And then it can receive that print packet of information and it can send it to the printer that's directly connected to the PC. So it gives a lot of nice features uh, like network-based software, but it, it does have, the at this point, a desktop um, architecture. They are building a web-based product and it is due for release sometime in the next few months, although everything has shifted uh, for obvious reasons. Another feature of Card Exchange that's really strong is its uh, smart card encoding and reading capabilities. It has a lot to offer there. So software, hardware, um, we're looking ahead now. We went from short-term solution, medium-term solution, what's up ahead. Uh, something that Color ID feels kind of strongly about, even though we're still in a lot of ways waiting for some solutions to arrive. We've talked about HID Safe, a very powerful physical identity access management software product, uh, enterprise type of product. Um, but there are a number of other solutions that offer these same kinds of functionality in various uh, levels, but what we what we think that is useful about this is it moves, it recognizes the need to manage identities rather than just create a card, you know, create a card, capture some data from the card, send it to this system, send it to that system. You know, it's sort of piecemeal. Um, our one card system does, it, does this, and then it goes over to the access control system, and then that does this. And then our one our, our st um, student information system does something else with the data. So it's sort of a, a connected web of data moving, but it's hard to control it centrally and get a look at it and monitor changes and the need for termination at various times. Whereas if you're able to have a, a, an identity management layer recognizing identity management as its own process, um, then you can have a layer that does that. And it can, it can function just to connect identity data. And, and so it, it would have, and, and some of the products that we're, we're working with various de developers on right now, they offer APIs for connecting. Um, Native database connections, ODBC, which has been there for a long time to connect your ID software to various databases. Flat file transfers will still have a place because so many institutions rely on them. But the problem with those, of course, are often that they result in really slow feeds. Um, one solution that we like a lot is called uh, Pinwheel by Swift Data, and it is an on prem database that is remotely managed by Swift Data and it has intelligence, it can assign permissions and access, it can put people in, it can take them out, it can do a lot of different things. But the thing about Swift Data that's impressive is the number of campus systems that they are directly connected to. So we are having conversations right, right now with many schools who have a need to automate the way data gets from the card office to various systems on campus or the way it gets into the card office. And uh, Pinwheel provides connections to all these different systems. Uh, for example, um, is Secure on here? Software House. So Secure is, is used by a number of schools and we're working with Pinwheel because they have an integration with Software House with Secure. And, and it's a way, Pinwheel has a way to get photos, for example, into Secure. Um, 
mentioned HID safe a moment ago. One of the things that it has that's striking is a self-service portal, and it does more than just upload a photo. You can actually request an ID, a card, you can re request a replacement card, you can report a card lost or stolen. And that, so this whole self-service feature that's built into SAFE and is starting to appear in some other products. Um, the reason for that, again, is because we're trying to manage, we're seeing a need to manage the full identity life cycle from the time that somebody enrolls or is hired or contracted all the way through until they leave the institution or are terminated or check out. And importantly, um, oh, not here, um, any changes. And, and again, recognizing identity management as a process in itself, discrete from all the different systems that absorb identity information, provides a way to, to handle these identities across all the different systems and it provides both security, but even more importantly, it provides convenience and good workflow. Things get done and they get done in a timely manner. Um, here's the safe architecture. Of course, instead of clouds in the middle, they have gears showing that it does stuff, but it has, um, it supports visitor kiosks, self-service portals. Again, they've been out there for about 15 years doing this, uh, mostly for large, corporations and uh, we've had some schools interested in this product and other solutions are coming along. Unifia has a mobile solution uh, that does uh, things similar to SAFE. There's some, some variation there. But but what they do is, is some of this is being done already, but it kind of brings together in one place all the features of identity management. You want to verify the identity, you want to enroll them in the system. If it's a mobile solution, you want to is, in, issue the credentials for all these various functions on campus. And if it, and it's these days, it's really uh, often important or useful if it's cloud-based. So you get security, it's easier to connect to things. And it's just part of the modern architecture of software systems. Um, I mentioned uh, visitors, temporary identities, and there will come a time when we will have visitors to residence halls again and other visitors to campus. Because again, there will be conferences, <laughs> there will be summer programs. So thinking ahead, a lot of these are just not managed very well. They're managed by the, uh, uh, the department, that has invited them, the, the res hall may have a, a visitor policy. They may or may not be policies and procedures that, that go across campus. Um, a lot of times, construction workers are not well managed at all. They walk on and off campus, they go to the card office, they get an ID card that has a, a chip in it that'll open doors. And there may be, in some cases we know of, there may be no requirement on the part of the card office for any kind of identification. They were just told, walk in there, get a card, and we'll see you at the job site. And so it it seems like we've gotten away without any trouble for a while, and that's great, but it seems like this is something that probably should be managed in some way. Um, the other thing about visitors on campus, Mark referred to this back at the beginning, We've, you know, we see news stories and, and have talked to schools that are now housing um, medical workers, sometimes uh, people who've tested positive. I, you know, this was from three weeks ago. I, I need to Google search and see, is anybody doing this now? Um, but we have a poll. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. So our next poll is, is your school housing visitors? Uh, so right now, uh, please select one. Let's see um, what type of responses we get. All righty. A um, couple more. Perfect. Okay. And I'm going to share my screen. Okay, here we go. So 80% none at this time. 13% we have heard that you might be housing some folks. 
7%, yes, we have some COVID-19 positive folks on campus, and 0%, yes, we are housing the homeless. So of those four, um, there you go. Pretty cool. Thank you. All right, interesting. Um, like I said, this was a hot news item about three weeks ago as I was preparing this for the first time we presented it. And uh, and evidently a lot, it didn't happen the way we thought. So uh, probably a relief not to have to deal with a lot of extra people on campus when there's nobody there to manage them or issue them cards. So, um, so another thing, some other uh, things to consider about managing temporary identities, which again, Identity management works not just for students, faculty, staff, but for visitors. Anybody you need to know who's on campus, when are they there, why are they there, anything about that, it, it's good to know their identity and have some ability for managing that. Um, visitors may not be in the one card system. You know, if they're not going to be doing the things that the one card system supports. Uh, we, we know quite a few campuses that have a whole separate ID station set up to issue cards to people who are visitors because their ID stations can only issue cards to people who are in the one card system. And this then you have this whole separate thing. So again, that indicates the one card system in those cases is not really supporting visitors. It's not supporting identity management across the board. Uh, sometimes there are needs to set expiration dates for credentials, maybe 24 hours or maybe 10 years if you have a uh, voter registration capability for your ID card. Um, again, that's managing the identity. You're gonna put that date on there and then you need to keep track of it. Something needs to happen at that time. Tracking, uh, obviously, you know, when was the card used? Where was the card used? And then managing all the permissions associated with those cards for visitors. So that's about all I could think about for a remote card office presentation. I did have a couple things to mention here at the end. Um, Color ID offers a custom web portal for ordering. We, like I said, we also do the recards. If you are looking, for, you know, like, oh, I wonder who could do a recard for us, a third party recard. Um, and then, interestingly, one of our card manufacturers here in the United States let us know that not only there are they an essential business because they make ID cards, but also because they're now making plastic face shields. So I guess a sheet of plastic is a sheet of plastic, whether it's big and clear or small and white. So, with all of that, I will bring this to a close and we can take any questions we may have. Cool, thanks David. So yeah, I've got a couple of questions here queued up from folks that answered throughout the webinar. Um, first up, does Cloud Card software work for Apple and Android? Yeah, that's a good question. Cloud Card it completely runs in a browser. So yes, it'll run on um, Apple, Android, mobile, laptop, you know, any anything. Perfect. Um, and the follow-up to that is how long does it take to get a photo submission system like Loudcard set up and running? Uh, well, it, you know, depends on your, on the number of features you can live with or without. If, if you require a full integration and you have a complicated system, and a lot of IT people who get involved in these processes, it can take six to eight weeks, um, mostly because it's about the school resolving answers to various questions. How are we going to do this thing? Who's the person that can give permission to do this? Because it's touching various systems on campus. But if you just need to get up and running and you're willing to do a manual export of your data, your email addresses, to the application and you're willing to import those. In other words, I mean, it's it's just a few mouse clicks really. And you're willing to do that even just daily, that kind of um, shape of the solution could be set up in a, in, a, in just a matter of a, a couple of weeks easily. Um, you can always add the integration features later, but if you're willing to live with the of a little bit of a, a manual process, then you can save weeks in the implementation. Cool. Thanks, Dave. Um, and lastly, for the, the photo submission topic, um, how do you verify government issued IDs? Well, the 
you know, the two solutions I described in detail both allow the upload of photos of government issued IDs, so driver's license or passport. Um, at this point, for those solutions, the best you can do is you open it up, you open it on a big screen, you can look at them really closely, <laughs> you can compare the photographs, you can look for the tiny print, in, and, and that is what you have. And, and really that's, I mean, you, the fact that you can magnify it on a big screen, it may be better than what you might do in person. Um, there are, if, if it, if, if, when we get to the point and there are, like I said, there's some products coming that support much more thorough authentication. There are scanners that can be used to read all the secret, um, visual security elements in a card or in a passport a driver's license. So, so there are other things that can be done. There are also other types of, um, checking that be, can be done, but they require support by other systems. A photo upload product itself is is not at this time offering a lot of back channel support for government issued IDs. Got it. Um, one question outside of the um, photo submission upload topic is in regards to Fargo Connect and other remote printing applications. Um, how do How does Fargo Connect help in a situation where you're physically limited to getting access to your printers to, you know, fill consumable replacements and cards and things like that? Well, yes, that is the that is the question. If you're able to send somebody into the office, they could go in in the morning, load the hoppers. Somebody could send the jobs. You don't, you know, they just can load them and leave, and then maybe come back in the afternoon, load, unload. Uh, clear jams, uh, but printers require some touching. You have to be there. Maybe maybe you get the printers with the great big hoppers, and uh, you know there are a few of those out there that'll hold a lot of cards, and and hopefully they don't get jammed, and you can crank out a lot of cards. But um, the fact that you're able to set up the print job and control it and monitor it from a distance is worth a lot. But you still because it's a you know, it's a physical printer and it's a physical card. At some point, somebody's going to have to show up and touch it. Pick it up in a hazmat suit and detox yeah. them and do whatever right. they have to do. Exactly. That's right. Um, so are, are we aware of any schools out there currently uh, verifying credentials remotely via like, you know, Zoom or Microsoft Teams, stuff like that? Not, no, not not with the video conferencing verifying credentials. I'm not aware of that. Have um, that's an interesting concept. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I haven't uh, picked up on any of that yet, but um, it's something that you know we could kind of scour the the list serves, whether it be you know NACU or, or NACUS. You might want to um, drop that question out there. Um, some of your um, Associates might might pick it up and, and have better input on that. Um, one question about hardware, um, you know, the HTP 5600 with lamination, will that unit work without uh, lamination if need be? And, you know, yeah, definitely you can set up your printer. Uh, just because you have a lamination module attached to it doesn't mean that you have to actually apply a lamination patch during the print process, you could either do one of two things. The easiest thing to do is just simply, you know, go into your print driver um, and, you know, just deselect the lamination uh, and a drop down to not use lamination uh, whenever you do print. Um, you could also find that, I think, in printing preferences. If you have any issues walking through that process, you can always call our uh, tech support folks. Uh, we're still around and um, they can walk you through it step by step, or they could just, you know, jump on a uh, go to meeting, um, you know, screen share type of uh, service to, to walk you through that. Uh, the other option uh, is a little bit more cumbersome, but you could physically take the lamination module off of the printer. Um, all that really connects the lamination module to a 5600 are two little tiny screws uh, underneath the printer. You unscrew those two guys, and then the unit will just slide out from one another, and then you just have a printer-only unit. And um, the, the driver will automatically see that, 
and know that, hey, there's no lamination to use to begin with and you're good to go. Um, so a couple of options there for you. Um, and with that, that was the, the last question that we got in uh, for today. So um, I, think, uh, I think we're good there. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and wrap it up. Um, great questions. Thanks for the interaction. Thank you all for participating. Um, please don't uh, miss out on our next webinar this week. That's on making and managing campus credentials. That, of course, is uh, this Thursday, April 30th at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, also, just a reminder that each webinar does require its own res uh, registration, so please be sure to sign up. Um, so with that said, on behalf of Danny, David, and myself, please be safe out there. Thank you so much for attending today's webinar. Goodbye.